Um, so today's topic is going to be the role of uh, research in, and development in Ghana's national um, development. And so um, those of you who, are, who just joined the session, uh, we were introducing ourselves earlier. So feel free to um, tell us in the chat your name, um, any activity that you are interested in and the highlights of your 2021. Um, you can just feel free to put that in the chat so that uh, we get to know you a little bit better. So basically, um, I'm sure many of us know, uh, if you're involved in the sciences, you know that there's this gap between science and the public. So for example, um, against all scientific evidence and um, against all the research that has been done, we are having a very big challenge with um, getting people to understand exactly what's going on with COVID-19. Um, getting people to follow the proper health guidelines and protocols, getting people to get vaccinated, for example. So um, climate change is also another big topic that uh, although we, we know that human activity is um, contributing to it, we are struggling to put in place the right policies and frameworks um, to address this challenge. And so the bottom line here is that there seems to be this gap between science and the public. And so how do we fill this gap? Uh, one of the strategies that we can use to fill this gap is to um, create the environment or create a landscape where science becomes part of culture. It's centralized in public life in a way that it makes it easy for every, uh, scientists to be able to connect better with members of the public and also for members of the public to be able to connect to scientists. So one of the UK's uh, leading scientific advisors said that science isn't finished until it's communicated. And so um, Science Cafe is just one of the uh, different formats, event formats that people use to connect um, science to the public. Um, and the reason why Science Cafe works is that it's accessible. Um, everybody can be part of it. It's usually informal, which means that we try to strip the conversation of the usual jargons so that um, anybody who is not even part of the field that is being, um, the, the field that the presenter is coming from can follow the conversation and, and understand. And at the same time, it's also very interactive, which means that everybody cannot contribute. Um, under normal circumstances, we'd have such an event in a physical space, for example, a library, a cafe, a bar, restaurant, wherever. But also, of course, we can also have it online in this day and age where Zoom event has become the norm. So uh, in terms of Global Lab, we started having the Science Cafe since 2018. Um, this is the 11th Science Cafe. So we've had 10 other Science Cafes in the past. Um, some of you have been to physical Science Cafes and some of you have only been to um, the online ones. So um, the picture at the top left, for example, that was the very first one that we had with Dalentina Kubu talking about artificial intelligence and its um, uh, relevance in Africa. And then the picture at the bottom right was the latest science cafe that we had with um, Dr. Um, uh, and, and, and this physiologist, I'm always struggling when, uh, when I'm trying to pronounce this word, uh, from uh, Focus uh, Hospital, Dr. Wolf. And it was also a very, very uh, interesting and fantastic conversation. So what started with, what started as a conversation uh, uh, with friends like Darlington, Jacob, has now led to um, a, a platform where um, it's also leading to new connections as far as um, science and society is concerned. So for example, um, Evelyn or Mamieji has been like one of our main participants through here. I've met people like Dr. Wolf, and Leo, actually, who's going to be our presenter for today. So you see not only science being shared, but uh, you see new connections and new friendships being created. Now, so for this year in 2021, uh, this is our fourth Science Cafe. So for now, we have it every quarter. And um, for, 2021, we've had three other events. So we started a conversation from talking about uh, COVID-19 and how to build resilience because the, the virus has become a reality. 
uh, of our times. And so we have to learn how to live with it and also um, how to be able to be um, very effective in our day-to-day -day life as well. But apart from that, we also talked about cosmology, for example. So we move from our everyday problems and challenges into the cosmos where we hosted for the first time um, a speaker from outside Ghana. So Professor Bruce Bassett uh, from the University of Cape Town, um, together with uh, Sarah from the Ghana Planetarium. And of course, as I was telling you earlier, we also talk about anesthesiology uh, with uh, Dr. Wolf. Um, um, I, I described the last science cafe that we had as a science communication <laughs> masterclass. And I'm sure those of you who were there uh, will bear me witness to that. So today we are going to be talking about the role of research and development in Ghana's um, national development. I'm sure this conversation has been had um, at different places or on various platforms, but it's important for us to have it again uh, because the context that we are operating with keeps changing. New technologies are coming, new research is being done, and we ourselves are getting more experience and we are getting the advantage of having new insights. And so we are really privileged to be able to focus on this topic today um, with our esteemed uh, panelists. So some of the things that we'll be talking about uh, include uh, looking at what the research and development landscape in Ghana is like, identifying certain gaps. Uh, we've heard a lot about a national research fund. What's the latest uh, with its implementation. And also, of course, how can we center research and development into uh, various national plans? For example, um, the government's digitalization agenda, uh, the one district, uh, one factory um, um, plan, et cetera, et cetera. Because we need to center um, science and technology into the core of what we are doing as a nation. So we are really fortunate indeed um, to have um, people who, are, who have spent time to think about this topic and, and to contribute our perspectives. So the structure that we are going to employ uh, involves um, having an initial uh, presentation from our main speaker, Leo Ayerakwa. And then after that, we will have um, a moderated panel with um, featuring Professor Marian Nkansa from Ken UST and also um, Dr. Kwame. As he, uh, Dr. Kwame Sapon as he And of course, we will have our usual uh, open discussion, Q and A's um, as well. So it's going to be a really, really uh, packed um, uh, evening. So brace yourselves for it. Um, I'll just now uh, go ahead and um, invite our, our main speaker for today, Leo, to make his presentation. But before he comes on, just um, a quick introduction um, or, or he's already introduced himself to the people here, but probably I'll just ask him to uh, reintroduce himself and then we can get on with the uh, presentation. So Leo, thank you very much for not only being an active part of Science Cafes, but also actually um, uh, uh, making yourself available and agreeing to be our facilitator for today's session. So, yeah, please introduce yourself to the garden whilst we get your slide and everything ready. Right, okay. Well, my name is Leo Ayurakwa, as I mentioned earlier, and I've had a 25-year career within the global pharmaceutical industry. Um, I'm based in near Cambridge, UK. Um, and, you know, pretty much spend much of my adult life in the UK, well, including A-levels, of course, but then all my education sort of after that has been in the UK. I graduated from London School of Pharmacy or UCL School of Pharmacy, part of the University of London. And after various postgraduate studies, um, I entered the pharmaceutical industry. I've played a variety of different roles across multiple disciplines and various therapeutic areas um, of, of research in, in medicine, pharmaceuticals, biomedical research, health sciences in general. I'm currently with um, a Japanese company in the European headquarters in the UK uh, called Azi Pharma Europe Limited. 
I've been with them for yeah a year. No, sorry, three years now. Three years now in the um, global regulatory strategy, but within the oncology biz business group, um, and also as a, a preclinical sciences expert within the group. And over my career, of course, R and D as it operates within the Western Hemisphere, I'm very, very familiar with. And so when I certainly got acquainted with Science Cafe, I was excited, definitely excited. And then, of course, within my own country of birth, which is Ghana, um, I know, you know, I'm familiar with a lot of the institutions, but that said, I don't have a whole lot of understanding of the R&D base within Ghana. So, I, you know, it really started as a personal project just to sort of try and research the R&D environment as it operates within my, my place of birth or my country of birth. And that's really how the idea came about. So when I was offered the opportunity to um, present for the last session of the um, you know science cafe I thought you know what a good place to start you know out of my own curiosity I thought I wanted to a learn a bit more about the R&D base within Ghana and not necessarily compared with where I spent most of my, my my life work as such but just to try and understand a bit more about it and to share and to obviously see how best it can be leveraged and improved for national development because at the end of the day you know i've always had a view of science and technology as a servant of society i mean the whole idea of um you know spending a lot of effort and commitment in in what science innovates about is to serve humanity and to serve society so that was the perspective with which i came to this and and so I'm delighted and indeed excited about the panel of um, other contributors to the, the debate and the discussion, um, you know, because I think they come from a, a very, very highly learned background, you know, which kind of intersects with mine. And so uh, I'm certainly looking forward to A, share what, I guess, if I could put it, little knowledge I know about the Ghanaian R&D environment and base and to learn a bit more and that's more or less as a way of preamble what we're here to do and I don't want to sort of spend too much time on the actual presentation itself and then sort of leave a bit more time to um, enable discussion and you know sort of intelligent debate or not, not debate as such of course it's not it's not about debate but just discussion and, and conversation and, and sort of learn from, from each other and from one another, really. So that's it. Thank you. So next slide then, Gamali, unless you wanted to sort of take over from here, otherwise I'm happy to dive in. Yeah, please continue. Okay. So like all presentations, I will start off with some disclaimers that there are no conflicts of interest in what I'm about to say, I do not have any governmental affiliations. I do not have any holdings of financial interest in any companies in Ghana, private or otherwise. Now, this presentation uses a lot of policy information or some policy information or statements that are sourced publicly. And I was quite fortunate actually, when I started researching this topic, um, sort of doing the, the usual Googling around and, sorry, I'm still, could you go back to, yeah sort of using various search engines, I, I, I sort of came across some very useful uh, policy information that sort of came straight from some of the government um, institutions that we have in Ghana. So it really helped me and I thought it, it's good to be upfront with some of the content and, and where they were sourced from. So, all right. So those are my disclaimers. First slide then, please. All right, so just a few quotes or quotations from me, well, not from me personally, but uh, from the famous Neil Armstrong, you know, famous uh, US astronaut who upon landing on the moon said is one small step for man, 
however it's one giant leaf for mankind you know i thought it's such a nice and beautiful phrase that encapsulates everything that you know science and technology has achieved for mankind and of course reflecting on the r and d base in ghana you know whatever state or shape it is i think it's good to sort of reflect on some of these simple statements that are highly encouraging and to have it in mind to say that no matter how small it is it is always that one small step you know however it is one giant leap for the future okay now the next quote comes from sir isaac newton you know who discovered gravity not too far from where i live you know just about 10 miles from me from you know at cambridge university and he said my powers are ordinary and it is only my application that brings me success and i thought what a beautiful phrase you know i've i've loved this ever since i learned about it you know that you know no matter what qualifications what degrees how learned you are it is your application that really brings you success and i think over the course of my 25 years you know uh, you know you mature and you grow and and you know that really the whole essence of education is to apply them and to bring it to society and make society all the more richer because of what you've invested in in yourself and how society have also invested in you now this last quote here um, um it, you know it, it's it's almost like a game which will be revealed at the end so here um you are more than free to google it but i just want the one who will come with the best answer for the person who owns this quote and it goes i went to new york i'm trying to do the accent i went to new york i wanted to sing i wanted to dance i wanted people to love me I worked very hard and my dreams came true. So there is your challenge and we would reveal the answers or the answer at the end of um, our discussion. All right, so next slide then. So by way of an agenda, um, of course, we will look at the R&D policy and implement implementation framework in Ghana. Then we'll look at the current state of R&D. Um, then we'll look at the future state where I'm most interested about and excited about and then of course beyond all the political rhetoric okay and then here i propose 10 point plan but these 10 point plans i mean they, they they're quite ordinary to be honest you know and they, they're nothing really i guess um you know nothing that is sort of too out of the ordinary as i said you know they're quite simple um but hopefully they are ambitious enough to kind of focus our minds and and i think for the purpose of the discussion, I know Gamale has um, pinpointed a few other topics that we will base our discussion on, but I think some of it will sort of overlay some of these 10 point plan that again, I, I sort of propose by way of how the future state may look like, all right? And then within that sort of trying to diagnose some of the challenges and the pain points and constraints that perhaps we have within the R&D base in Ghana. And of course, all of this, as I said, is for harnessing R&D for or its potential for economic growth and, and national development. Next slide then, please. All right. So from some of the material that I got, um, the essence of the R&D policy and implementation framework is that it, it sees a vision of Ghana that is transformed to become a developed country with STI or science, technology, and innovation as its key driver. And of course, it's to build strong capacity to drive social economic development for the sustainable transformation of the economy. Now, it, it's such a beautiful uh, vision. And, and in fact, you know, it is part of the United Nations um, Sustainable Development Goals that I think a lot of countries around the world actually sign up to. So of course, for countries within our region or within our part of the world, you know, to transform our economy to become a, a developed country is of course a vision, but of course, how do we do that, you know? And this R&D policy framework, you know, foresees um, the leveraging of science, technology, and innovation as a key driver in attaining those goals. And, you know, what a beautiful and lofty goals to have, you know? So, it's about wealth creation if you 
harness it properly and of course alleviate poverty. Um, and it's about building your industries or the capacity for those industries and to become more enterprise and then therefore competitive, you know, but of course do it in a sustainable environmental management um, process or, 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 or systems, okay? So it's about boosting industries for economic success and prosperity. Next slide then, please. Yeah, I think you've gone too far. Yeah, next next slide. That's it. Yeah. So you know, like like all policies or, or policy frameworks, you know, it must serve various sectors of the economy. And 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 quite naturally, you know, this is quite a comprehensive list. And and I really admire the vision and the and the and the coverage, you know. So of course. It ranges from agriculture to health to education to energy, of course, to youth innovation. And, and I'll, I will spend a couple of minutes on youth innovation as, as, as we progress in the presentation. You know. So it covers a whole plethora of ideas and sectors of the economy, which is great. I mean, this isn't different to, I would say, the R&D framework within any Western society. It is no different, you know. So I certainly was enthused and really, really got excited seeing the coverage and, and how broad and comprehensive that is, okay? And so Ghana is no different. And I guess Africa in general is no different in terms of if like the the, the, the vision and the, and the, and the level of, um, I, I guess, expectation that it won from itself and from its citizens for the future. All right, next slide, please. Okay. Now, with the government of Ghana, um, you know, of course, the, the way you implement STI or science, technology, and innovation policy is through the, the, the government or the government department that will be able to coordinate across all the different functions. And, and within the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation, or MESTI for short, um, you've got a directorate called the STI directorate, you know, amongst various other directorates that sort of coordinates the whole STI policy across the country. So the STI directory within the MESTI or the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation actually develops and help coordinate and then therefore implements all of that. So that, that's all great. And of course it works with various government agencies, you know, such as the, um, I think you guys would be better placed to knowing what these agencies are, which is the CSIR, which is I think the, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, uh, the uh, Ghana Atomic Agency uh, is a commission, I think, yep. And then the Environmental Protection Agency and, and a whole other agencies that help to implement on the ground some of these, you know, science, technology, and innovation policies. And of course, there are academy, academia also that, that helps in, in all that effort. Um, you've got KNUST or the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology and, and Legon, of course, University of Ghana. And, and a number of other universities, I'm sure the list is, is much longer than this, but suffice to say that, you know, from a government level, if you look at the structure, it is quite well thought out and the vision is as grand as any other vision that I've ever seen within the Western Hemisphere in terms of its coverage, all right? Now, the last bullet point here talks about PAX, PAXT, all right? And it says it is, it stands for the Presidential Advisory Council on Science, Technology, and Innovation. And it's supposed to be an independent advisory body. So I guess it's set up outside of government's influence. Okay. So the the, the first, well, the, the the first bullet points. So you've got the MESTI and you've got the agencies under MESTI, and then you've got the academic centers also. So they all you can say that they have some influence from government in who runs them. But the PAXT is supposed to be independent advisory specifically to the president, all right? And again, I got so excited that we have an overseen body um, called the PAXT, which is independent from government. And so we will see in the next slide what the role of PAXT is. So next slide then, please. All right. So PAXT's function 
or functions are to provide advice to the president of the land and his ministries on the science, science technology innovation policy formulation and the program design. Okay, so it's to sort of offer input or advisory input into um, you know the government and therefore the president and his government's um, program on, on STI. And I've highlighted the third bullet point where amongst Pakistan's functions to provide STI advocacy so that the voice of the country's STI community will be represented in the country's programs and policies at all levels, all right? So again, it doesn't lack in vision at all. It doesn't. So that the voice of the country's science, technology, and innovation community will be represented in the country's programs and policies. So, of course, I got excited about this, in, well, mainly because here we are um, as a science community and within the STI framework and its implementation, there is actually a line that says, so the voice of the country's STI community, and, and I'm including you and I in that, all right? So that that voice will be represented in the country's programs and STI policy at, at all levels. Okay, so moving on, I mean, I highlighted simply because I got excited about the fact that, you know, the government isn't ignoring, you know, the, the, science, the scientific community. So amongst its programs and amongst its formulation of the policy, there is some consultation from the country's scientific community and our voice or voices are heard within that. So again, not to labor it too much, I think I've highlighted the point. So next slide then, please. All right. And then, of course, like any policy, you've got to monitor it, you've got to measure it, etc. And this is all part of the work of Paxty, certainly as far as I understand it. OK, if I'm wrong in the discussion, we can we can certainly um, discuss it and explore it a bit further. So it measures the STI policies and, and whether it's achieving it, you know, its goals. Uh, it promotes the development and utilization of the STI capacity. And it promotes science and it promotes engineering at all levels. It promotes participation of women in science and technology. Um, it strengthens the protection of IP or intellectual property and innovation rights, all right? So next slide then, please. For some reason, okay. All right, okay. And then of course, it talks about mechanisms for funding STI, which is a, a, a critical aspect of how you, you, you move your R&D base forward um, and, and def definitely leverage it for economic and, um, well, and national development, you know, for, for prosperity of the nation. And again, in the interest of time, and I'm not just gonna read every single item or bullet, but on the last bullet, it says it's, meant to allocate a minimum of 1% of GDP of the nation's, um, you know, the nation's wealth, you know, yearly wealth towards science and technology. Um, and so that, that is equally, you know, a, a laudable effort. And yeah, I would think it is ambitious. And, you know, for those of us who live in the West, you know, this minimum of 1% is, in my mind, yes, it can always be more, but if you compare it even to the UK, for example, where for an advanced nation like the UK, I know the scientific community cries for more money all the time, all right? So it isn't unique to Ghana or unique to Africa that um, you could always do with more funding into research and into R&D specifically. But here, the government is committed 1% of its national wealth on an annual basis to the science and technology sector. Okay, next slide. All right, so very quickly on the current state. And again, that is my understanding of the current state in terms of what I think it's very hot as a topic, of course, COVID and how we protect society 
from the ravages of, of this pandemic is, is, is very topical, all right? So this body called the REGIC or the Research and Grant Institute of Ghana, um, they're supposed to be a voluntary sector um, organization. And, and, and again, I was fortunate enough to find a lot of information um, from their website and I was able to sort of understand a little bit about the current state of affairs and especially with COVID, it, it, it certainly was timely that this body, although I don't believe it's, it's been set up for very long, I think they, they were set up around the, the late, um, you know, the, the late 2000s. And then um, on the 30th of April, 2019, they gave their very first lecture, um, sort of, I think they, they, they obviously trying to, um, I guess, speak to the, um, to the community and to the society about what they do in terms of national research and innovation. So they've got a series of lectures and I think 2019 was their very first lecture, which, you know, incidentally kind of um, coincided with COVID the following year. So here they were talking about, um, I mean, on their website, of course, they were talking about how Ghanaian scientists contributed to the sequencing of the, the, the genome of the coronavirus, you know, which is, Again, great, because now Ghana isn't just sitting idle and certainly using whatever capacity it has to contribute to um, tackling, you know, global issues. And of course, with the pandemic, you know, Ghana taking part in genome sequencing, it's, it's a very laudable effort. So these are some of the current state of R&D in Ghana which I think is positive and, and ought to be celebrated. And of course, the key here is to kind of expand it and make it better and better and better all the time, okay? Now, next slide then, please. All right, so again, here from the Research and Grant Institute of Ghana, um, you know, they, they, they were talking about, of course, collaboration between key stakeholders is critical and indispensable to socioeconomic growth and development, which, you know, which is true, you know, it's nothing new. Um, and then the third bullet point talks about the next phase of dialogue should really be centered on how the different stakeholders, which I'm sure you know is between government, academia, and of course the private sector, um, how they can better, or how they can actually engage with each other. And now I've put that, I've sort of highlighted they actually engage with each other, which I thought was quite interesting. I mean, I mean, what do you mean by actually engage? You either engage or you don't, but actually engage, what does it mean? So I kind of, it, it sort of, I had to flag it. And so maybe we can debate it a bit more just to sort of understand what is actually going on. You know, do we have a clearly defined um, R&D base or environment um, that brings together government, academia and the private sector together? Yes or no? And if we do, what do you mean by actually engage? But anyway, now, um, again, without, in the interest of time, I don't want to sort of focus on every, every single point, but the last point is here, it says, the findings from research endeavors could be used to guide not only government policies and programs, but also to accelerate industrial growth, you know? So, so to me, these are the right words. These are the right visions. These are the right mission statements. and you know, I couldn't be more excited, you know, that within our own region, you know, we have, you know, such intelligent um, ideas to sort of make things better, you know, make things better. And so I want to understand, you know, whether there is a clearly defined environment within Ghana, but of course within our region in Africa as a whole, um, that we could clearly call a scientific community that creates an ecosystem that brings together all the different elements and stakeholders with one single focus, one single vision to bring the nation from one level to the next in terms of all the outputs of R&D being put to economic use. You know, in the same way that if you then sort of link it back to some of the STI policy framework that we discussed on my very first slide into this whole presentation. It talks about 
a Ghana transformed into a developed country where amongst other things is to leverage STI for economic development, you know, poverty reduction, all of that. So the framework is there, the vision is there, but let's see everything about translation of all those lofty goals into action. And look at, of course, there are challenges, no doubt there are challenges, but I think the key here is, is to understand that challenges affect just about every economy that I think most of you people are aware of. You know, the UK has its own challenges. The R&D environment cries for money all the time. You know, no matter how much they get, they think it's not enough, it's inadequate. You know, Ghana is no different, you know? And of course, everything is relative, all right? Everything is relative, uh, but perhaps Ghana and Africa as a whole has some particular or peculiar challenges, which of course has got to be acknowledged in the same capacity. Next slide then, please. All right, so research challenges in Ghana. And again, a lot of the information and material um, was gained from the Regig, um, you know, guys. You know, the, their website was rich with a lot of information. So I was able to sort of take as much as possible, of course, time didn't allow for me to sort of do a much wider search to look at other bodies or other um, institutions that may perhaps offer a, you know, you know, perhaps a different perspective, but still with the view to having a better understanding of the R&D environment, the R&D base within my place of birth or country of birth. Next slide, all right. So again, I don't want to labor all of this they talk about you, you know, general economic and political considerations are some of the challenges. And here, I've, I mean, I promised myself that on this, uh, on this talk, we're not going to discuss politics, and we shouldn't because we are not a political organization. But beyond that, you know, it's it's difficult not to, I guess, talk or discuss about some of the challenges in R&D without perhaps talking about government and its effort and input into R&D, you know, so it is difficult to simply ignore that. But, you know, truly, I don't want the focus to be on what government is doing or not doing. We all know that it could do better, it could do more. But I think it's more about peer-to-peer -peer discussion you know, and how the, the, the peer environment is doing and encouraging and in fact influencing policy because if you think back to what Paxley is meant to do being a, a, presidential, a presidential advisory council is also sort of garner all the voices of the nation including the scientific community you know which is why I highlighted it you know, so for me I was doing my own research that relates to me and relates to my role in, I guess, in society, you know, and how among my peers, we can do better, all right? Whether it's through advocacy or intensified advocacy, but certainly pushing the boundaries of R&D and, and science in general for the betterment of, of society, all right? So again, I'm not gonna labor too much about this, all right? So next slide, in fact, next slide. All right. So now here, I just wanted to spend a bit, a bit of time on on some of the the data or statistics in terms of research output or input from Africa as a whole, but of course on individual country level. So this figure here, um, again, some stats that is found on the Regic web web page, where um, you know I think the forty four point seven million are the very top or the very first bullet is the global publication output all right over a 21 year period but of that less than two percent were actually produced from Africa as a whole all right and it sort of breaks it down into continental analysis where you know quite obviously South Africa led the led, led the pack all right and of that essay produced um you know a little over 200,000 publications 
you know, and it was the, the, the largest contributor to, um, if like, global R&D publications or whatever you want to think about it. And they were closely followed by Egypt and then Tunisia after that. And interestingly, Ghana came in the ninth position with 13,851, you know, publications, you know. I mean, I don't know whether it's good or bad. It is what it is, okay? But the, the whole idea is to see how Ghana can do better, you know, can be more competitive and can do better and to attract funding, both internally sourced, but also externally sourced. And so the graph there just sort of breaks it down into the different regions, you got Western Europe doing their thing, Northern Europe, you know, et cetera, you know, you know nothing exciting, but I, I thought it was interesting to sort of provide some, some data in terms of how we are looking in terms of our own place within the global research or R&D community. All right, next slide, please. And again, more, more um, pictures. And, and here, well, I, I thought the figure two was interesting because um, it talks about publication trend in Ghana between 96 and 2016. Uh, so over a 10 year period, uh, or maybe 20 year period, sorry. Um, and yeah, interestingly, it seems to be going up and up, you know, which is great, you know, so I don't fault it, you know, it, it, it's showing the right trend, it's, it's moving in the right direction. So, you know, you can't really fault the fact that it is moving in the right direction, all right? Okay, and then the figure three talks about Ghana's position in Africa by discipline in terms of the R&D output or sadly publication. So here, uh, it looks at agriculture at the very top and then STEM education or STEM training and then research in the environment, research in health, arts and humanities, business, social sciences. And I think if you look across from the left to the right, you know, the, I think what it's trying to say is that in Ghana, uh, we, I think a lot of our effort is coming um, a lot of our research output seems to be coming out of the social sciences and maybe business. And because here we placed fifth within Africa by discipline. And then in arts and humanity, you know, we sort of somewhere in the middle. And then, um, you know, but when you go to the really, I guess, deep and hardcore science, you know, because you're talking about STEM here, but STEM, I think we were around number 10. And then in agriculture, which is a key player in our, in our economy, we, we came 12. In other words, you know, research or quality research, I might add, you know, into agriculture and how it can best be practiced or it can best be improved. You know, we came 12th across the entire Africa. And then within STEM education, we're uh, around number 10, which is, I guess, not too bad. It can always be better. You know, environment came ninth, you know, but we are doing much better within the, you know, the, the business and social sciences. I don't know. I don't know whether, uh, to, to what extent that is true for, for those who know much more than I do, but that's, that's what I, I, I came across. All right. So next slide, then, please. All right. So here it talks about you know, the second bullet point, using R&D data from 20 OECD countries uh, and 10 non-OECD countries uh, by ELCO 2004, uh, they found a very strong correlation between R&D slash innovation and per capita income, of course, you know, it's, it's a no brainer, you know, but I think, you know, it's interesting to understand peer to peer that yes, there is a strong correlation between um, R&D, you know, and innovation and also GDP, you know. Um, and I, I think, in fact, go to the next slide. I think that's, yeah, yeah, okay. Now this slide I thought was quite interesting. And again, I'll try and explain it. So here, it, it sort of pairs publications against GDP per capita across that 20 year period of 96 to 2016, all right? So the blue bar is the 
volume of publications, okay? And then the orange bar is obviously GDP per capita. And you can see that over the years, it's shifting towards the, the, you know, from left to right, where it's sort of on an upward trend, which is great, you know? So, so I think the optics looks great. You know, for me, I, I got excited about this, that the optics look great. And, and over the years around, let's, let's look at 2016, for example. So public, the level of publication was, was quite high and naturally GDP is also high, but I was just wondering and just wondering again, maybe it's, it, it will be part of the discussion that, you know, is the, the R and D output attracting investment such that the investment is boosting GDP or is it a mixture of the two? It would be interesting to understand, you know, but the, the the actual trends look great. And and again, you could always do better. Um, we saw Ghana's um, position within Africa as a whole, where we came ninth. And, and I think this was uh, 2016, you know, based on, you know, quite old data. Uh, we'll be interested to see, you know, how, how, how better we are doing, you know, with, with current data. But from the ninth position, um, I'm wondering, is the quality of research and therefore the volume of research sort of attracting inward investment such that it's also improving GDP per capita? I don't know. I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. You know, but of course, you could flip it the other way where you can, you know, imagine that as the wealth of the nation grows hopefully naturally, um, there is more money of the 1% minimum uh, of GDP allocated to, um, to R&D that naturally that would also boost um, the volume of research. And of course, that, 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 is, that, that is also a, another viable argument. And it will be interesting to see, you know, the, the, the dynamic interplay between the two. But of course, I think the key message here I want to say is that I hope the volume and the quality of research is attracting inward investment such that that is also uh, helping Ghana's bottom line. And I think that's part of the future state that we need to look at, okay? Right, so future state. Next slide then, please. Right, so my 10 point plan, and again, this isn't rocket science. And this, you know, to be honest, isn't anything new or anything, um, extraordinary, you know, there's nothing extraordinary. And I think, you know, thinking back to the quote from uh, Sir Isaac Newton, where he says that, you know, my powers are ordinary, you know, but it's my application, you know, that makes me um, successful or something to that order. Um, so here I'm looking at motivational behaviors as one of the key priorities, okay? And we can discuss it and explore it a bit, a bit further in our, in our uh, panel discussion. You know, but then next in line, I thought a committed strategy towards prototyping, R&D piloting of inventions for scale up. You know, I'm an industry person. I, nothing gets me so excited about, you know, in my line of work, I advise biotech startups and a lot of them are academia, academics, and they've got this exciting idea and they want to bring it to industry. And I come in with all my, you know, uh, discovery hat. I come in with my R&D hat and we sit down academic to academics, to industry, to regulators, because we're taking them through the whole regulatory, you know, um, roadmap and everything else. And so from discovery to R&D is, is a whole different ball game, you know. It's a whole different ballgame. So we get excited about the inventions and the know-hows and everything else. But then bringing it to commercially viable products is a whole different ballgame, you know. And in my field, data and more data is king, all right? So we're looking at a committed strategy towards prototyping, R&D piloting of our ideas and inventions for scale up because it's only scaling up that you are in the end, if you're going to improve your uh, GDP per capita, alleviate poverty, you need to manufacture and sell. 
you need to manufacture and sell. Hopefully you're doing it locally, but even better, you're exporting, all right? Now, third bullet point, improve government funding and private investment into the R&D sector. Again, nothing new. I mean, nothing new. Just, we're just calling for it to be improved, that's all. Improve focus on quality STEM education. Again, nothing new, but we'll would explore, you know, the whole idea is to explore the pain points. What are the constraints? You know, how can we do better? Is it behavioral? Is it, are we not motivated enough? Are we not ambitious enough? You know, those are some of the, the, the things that are simple as they are, I think they're key to economic prosperity and national prosperity and wealth creation, you know. So again, I don't want to go through all of it. Um, I, I mean, I, I'll pick on a couple, you know, cultural business creation and entrepreneurship, you know. Um, you know, national recognition for local inventors and innovators. I think that is important. That is so important. You know, the West have, of course, we all know about the Nobel um, Committee that every year um, celebrates several key contributors, significant contributors to the fields of economic science or uh, physics or um, you know, medicine and physiology, uh, or, or literature, for example, and, and peace, of course, you know, you need to recognize people. And, and I wonder, do we have such a similar system within our, you know, our community? And not just that, I don't mean our community, at a national level, you know, within what Paxty is doing, are they advising the president to make this a highly visible uh, endeavor, you know, so it puts a lot of emphasis and a lot of importance and therefore commitment to what you actually say you want to do about R&D and how you're actually supporting it, okay? And then last bullet point, visibility and influence of the Ghanaian scientific and technology community. I think it's so key and that's why I'm excited about, you know, a lot of the conversations that take place on the Science Cafe. And of course, beyond that, you know, I want us to translate a lot of that into action, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. So I think I'm gonna pause here. The next slide, uh, okay, please go to the next slide. And, and again, please go to the next slide. Yeah. So I've got a couple of YouTube clips here. All right. I hope we're able to watch a few uh, or, or certainly snippets of a couple of those links. And the idea here isn't about, um, and again, maybe I'm displaying my naivety here, but you know, you can't be on social media without getting the video from, um, you know, this video going uh, viral about some school children in, um, I don't know, uh, Asinkwishia, for example, where they've come up with this nice gadget or nice idea about how they can generate electricity from, you know, from, from plants or from the, the microbes, you know, within soil. And again, you know, I, I wish I was that smart when, when I was at secondary school at Achimota, you know, but, you know, in today's society with the advent of social media, we're able to see what is going on within our own society. And so I put a few clips there just months ago to help stop the spread of coronavirus. And actually this machine is not just for the prevention of coronavirus, but a general purpose machine as well. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. I call it Elot Portable Hand Washing Station. And this is just a prototype. Let me show you how it works. First of all, this unit can hold up to 35 liters of fresh water. There is a container for liquid soap and the waste water goes to the bottom of the unit. You fill it with fresh water through this hole here and liquid soap goes here. It has two sensors, one for soap and one for fresh water. If you want to wash your hand, it's very simple. You place your hand above the soap sensor and it dispenses liquid soap. If you want water, you do the same and water comes out. And if you want to drain out the waste water, there's a valve here. When you open the valve, everything comes out. It's fully automatic, you don't need to touch anything. And when the light goes off, you don't need to worry at all. It has a backup battery that can run for 24 hours. 
This unit can be used in our churches, hospitals, schools, event grounds, camping. As I said, it's a general purpose machine. It comes in two versions, one electric and one manual. It's portable and it can be moved around easily. So ladies and gentlemen, that is it. I want to start mass production of this great product. And please and please, I need your support on this one. If you know any investor out there, if you know any businessman who can help me bring this product on the market, please connect me with that person. If you're out there, you think this product should be on the market and you want to support financially, you can donate to my MTN mobile money account or my GT bank account. The details are on the screen and please, I'm counting on you guys to help me fund this project. Thank you, Asante Sana, and that's it. All right. Thank you very much, Gamali. I think in the interest of time, we're not going to spend any more time than we've already taken. All right. I think we all get the idea and, and what I wanted to articulate um, across. So I think that might be my last slide um, for, for the presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Leo. Um, I watched a couple of those videos. They're also very interesting videos. So what we'll do is that when we are done with the presentation, uh, with the session, just, just so that we can cover the scope of what we want to do today, um, we can, we'll still play the videos. I think to get together, it won't be more than 15 minutes. And so we can still play the videos for those who want to stay behind um, to watch it. Um, so um, I'm just going to um, go in straight into the, uh, the discussion part. I have a few questions that I will ask um, you and um, the other panelists, and then, uh, of course, open it up for um, comments from everybody. Uh, mind you, there are already um, a lot of comments um, and chats um, um, in the chat section, so you can check it out as well, and then we'll get back to some of the issues that people are raising. Uh, so at this moment, I'd like to invite um, our other speakers, of course, we have Professor Marian in cancer from KNUST in the house. Um, I've, I've been on a case for a while now to come to Science Cafe, so we are, I'm, I'm really happy to have you. And I, I believe in the future, we'll have to come to Kumar City to do an in-person <laughs> Science Cafe <laughs> with you. <laughs> and we also have um, Kwame Sapona Siedu, um, who actually has been a speaker at um, um, Science Cafe, I think um, November, no, this is November, November last year as well. Um, yeah, so good to have you with us again, Kwame. So please turn on your videos so we can see you. <laughs> okay, Prof, before we, we go ahead and start the discussion properly, can you um, please introduce yourself once again to, to everybody here so they get to know you and your work? All right, good evening, all of you. My name is Maren Asantiwa Inkas. I like to add the Asantiwa. And I teach at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. My specialty is environmental chemistry. And I have done this since January 2007. So next year will be my 15th year of teaching in the university. I look at um, pollutants basically and contaminants in every environmental matrix you can think of, including human uh, clinical samples. And I'm also interested in the science, technology, innovation landscape and policy conversations and then public science engagement generally. So I think that is what I share in common with Gamali and that is why he's been on my case for about two years now, <laughs> trying to get me to be- Actually involved. also the environmental health staff as well. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Yes. <laughs> but I am so busy, so I haven't been able to make time. Even this week, I am very tired, but I decided to do this <laughs> oh, <laughs> before the year ends. The year 2021 started with a lot of uncertainties, but I think I ended with gratitude. I have, I'm happy with how the year has turned out. Yes. Awesome. I don't know if that is enough. <laughs> yes, I think I think it's I think it's I think it's great. We published your bio also on the on the blog of Ujilab. So yeah, but it's fantastic. Um, I, I also wanted to add because Leo talked about visibility 
Um, she's also an ex Einstein Forum uh, fellow, and uh, um, that's like the class and the cohort of um, African scientists who are the cutting edge of science in Africa. So we are really lucky and pleased to have her. Yeah. Um, Young Academy. And Global Young Academy, <laughs> yes. So lots and lots of things. Still so still many things. <laughs> yeah, and I mentioned Next Science Time Forum because I'm affiliated with Next Science Time Forum. But yes, of course, the Global Young Academy, I have some good friends there. So, um, yes, yeah, so over to you, Kwame. Can you please? Um, I know you introduced yourself already, but I'm sure so many people who are new, um, who, um, who came into the session, they didn't meet you. So, like, just give us a, a short summary of what you're about. Um, my name is Kwame. Um, likely, I'm a pharmacist. My primary training is in pharmacy. And I always want to emphasize that because that is what made me. And from there, I moved on to do drug analysis and quality control. And that's where, again, I shift towards Marion and Leo as well because um, I'm an analyst and I'm into quality as well, so I do. Uh, in my previous life working with Her Majesty's Prisons in the UK, I used to do bodily fluids and all that analysis and all that thing. And in quality control, I've worked with the pharmaceutical industry around um, product development and all those aspects, which is what I think Leo does most of the time. And then I shifted to do all what I call the crap in biomedical pharmacy, which is what predominantly now, when it comes to public speaking, I do thanks to what we call COVID, because it spans everything that I've done, right from um, what you know to what you don't know. So you're looking at a whole lot of things. And then, um, Currently, I spend most of my time working in civil society work, CDD Ghana, and in public speaking globally around the barriers between science, research, governance, and advocacy, which is a huge thing because if one learning I want anyone to take from COVID it's the fact that thanks to the relegation of science to the background compared to things like economics and law, the world got deceived around the fact that we could progress in a manner that didn't take cognizance of our environment, didn't take cognizance of the extent of our pollution, the extent of climate change, the extent of human inhabitation. And suddenly you switch on the telly globally from the United States to UK, right to Ghana. And every single minute you see a scientist trying to define the direction in which the world economy is going to move. And that is a huge learning for all of us. And for me, looking at what Gamala, you guys want to do, that is the biggest learning that the failure of science, especially in Africa, is the inability to connect it to our development and to bring it to the doorstep of the general public. And that is where I spent the last two years working. And for me, that is why I think though 2021 has been challenging, it's been rewarding as well because I've tried to devolve myself from being a scientist to being a social scientist. And it's been a huge change, but it's been enjoyable. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for this wonderful point about the need to bridge um, uh, science and society. I think that this is um, at the heart of uh, the discussion uh, here today as well. So um, I'll give you the opportunity to first of all, react to some of the uh, points that Leo made in his presentation. And I would like to start with Prof because we are talking about uh, research and development in Ghana. You are a researcher in Ghana. You are a teacher in Ghana. Do you have any thoughts, um, yes. any reflections? Yes, I, I think uh, Leo has done a fantastic job, though he doesn't live in Ghana. <laughs> what he has captured is everything I have on my paper. And um, a, a little bit to add to it is the involvement of academia in the landscape. 
So it's the CSIR, which you rightly mentioned, and the other institutes for medical research like Noguchi and KCCR in Kumase, and then the universities, and then Ghana Atomic Energy Commission. These are the major drivers of our uh, research and development landscape in Ghana. And interestingly, CSIR has 13 institutes looking at different aspects of our, uh, the use of R&D for our development. And currently, CSIR is suffering a lot with regards to innovation and funding with conversation that I have had with colleagues. So with all these framework, as you rightly said, with the MESTI framework of 21 target areas, which was put together between 2017 to 2020, quite recent. And then the Presidential Advisory Council also very quite recent. With all these frameworks and target areas, uh, if we are going to go by what is in the book, <laughs> then we have everything we need to be called a developed country. And so I, I would like to say that, yes, we have the framework in, in place and uh, all these institutions which, which drive or which are supposed to be driving the agenda are doing their best. I'm sure when we go further in the discussion, I might highlight on some of the things some of these institutes are doing in terms of the success stories. But uh, the area I see an issue with is the disconnection between these entities. There is no area of uh, convergence. So we are all acting as players in, in isolation. And that probably is one of the reasons why we are not making the gains that we all expecting to make. And if we were to be conscious about this, then we will move further forward than we have done. I also like to react to Leo's uh, graph on research output in Ghana and the fact that it's increasing quite uh, Encouragingly, I think the issue there is that yes, we are churning out knowledge, but what is that information being used for in terms of our development agenda? So yes, as a professor, you do you, you churn out papers, very good information. The rest of the world picks it up. You get applauded for it. You get your promotion, and then what? <laughs> Our graduate students do their thesis, they come out with fantastic ideas, innovations, they get their degrees, and then what? So where we need to pay attention more on is to see a day where we, there's a conscious effort to connect what is done in research to development, and that is where your prototyping uh, comes in, and then um, I, I, I found that very laudable. Because until we do that, we if you look at the kind of the caliber of researchers we have in Ghana, there is almost nothing we cannot do. <laughs> but where we the gap is is how to connect what the, the knowledge uh, generated, especially in basic research, into applied research, into prototyping, and then into commercialization of uh, these new ideas, and. Um, Though I don't want to jump the gun, I think the 1% GDP that needs to be com committed that you made mention of, is still a promise. <laughs> Again, let, let me add my voice to the disclaimers that I don't speak for anybody, I don't speak for any political party, I don't speak for any institution, I speak for myself. I don't even speak as an expert on the topic. <laughs> I just speak for myself as a scientist, a practitioner in Ghana, based on what I see and what I have observed. So this will be my opening remarks on the on the topic. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, of course, um, the one percent GDP um, investment in research is something that has been on the table for a very long time, and it's not being realized. And of course, if it's not being realized, we have to um, speak about it. The same thing is happening in many other African countries, and it's a, it's a huge problem. Um, so I'll, I'll go to you, Kwame. I know you've made some few points already. Uh, in connection with the subject matter, but do you have any specific input or reactions to um, those present presentation? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's interesting. I find myself, and I'll make a disclaimer here, I find myself sitting in a pseudo-privileged position. And why do I say that? My dad was Deputy Director General of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research 
and um, Director of Forest Research Ghana and President of the International Union of Forest Research Organizations for a long time. I grew up on USD campus. My umbilical cord actually sits in the oh. Kirk Hospital. <laughs> so for me, I'm a professor's son. And so people like Maria are my parents. And I've always, even though I lectured in the faculty of pharmacy myself when I graduated and all that, I've always seen professors as my parents because I grew up, when I was growing up as an adult, the likes of Professor Kwame Sapom, Bwaki Yadom, Juma Bedu, you name it, were my dad's colleagues who actually, I lived on Richard West. So I talk with a bit of background experience and historical antecedents because when you've grown through the trajectory that has led us to this point, you know why the 1% became 1% that has never been achieved. And you can go back to things like the Abuja Declaration of 2001, where all African countries decided that for us to progress our research and development and research in health and the health sciences, we needed to invest 15% of our GDP or government expenditure in health. We had presidents who went to sign all these documentations they knew that it would benefit us. And 20 years on from 2001, not a single African country has even met 50% of that. Nobody has even invested 7.5% of their um, government expenditure in health or research and development. Let alone the one person. Kwame, it, I'm so, sorry to interject. Um, I, I just wanted to pick you up a little bit on the um, I think you mentioned 15%. The Abuja, so the Abuja Declaration asks for what, 15%, right? Yes. But that's specifically for um, like health, health. Like health. health yes. systems. Yeah. Okay, so, so that's 15% of the national wealth, the GDP. No, government expenditure, not oh, government national expenditure. Wealth. Oh, all right, expenditure. right. Should be because when you look at GDP, then you are adding in private expenditure and development assistance, but yeah. government expenditure. Right. So if you look at Ghana, that comes to about 7.3% because um, the, if you look at our health expenditure per capita, government only pays about 38, 39%. So if you look at it, but we are doing about 3.4%. That was where I was going to. And it's great that you interjected because then it brings clarity to the conversation. We've never met any of these numbers. So you have the likes of Marion sitting there. And that's where the problem starts. I lectured for close to two years after I finished graduate school in the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Chemistry. Mm -hmm. I'm a pharmaceutical chemist. And you would realize that your research is primarily funded externally compared with internally. Mm -hmm. So I leave the UK from the University of Portsmouth and land in Ghana. And the Medical Research Council is primarily fund, still funding me. They have priorities. Mm -hmm. And their priorities would never be Ghana determined. So though I, at that time, was researching on the quality of drugs in moving in international commerce and counterfeiting and all that, the priority was not on how it affects the healthcare provision or quality of care uh, or treatment failure when it comes to Ghana, West Africa, or Sub-Saharan Africa, or Africa. It was more prioritized on how it impacts on the patents of the larger pharmaceutical companies whose patents were being attritionized by spurious medicines. Okay. So you see that this connect, the same thing that can benefit us properly was being skewed to benefit the pipers because he who pays the piper calls the tune. Mm -hmm. And it is going on 20 years down the line. I left the Faculty of Pharmacy as a lecturer in 2004, 2005, having gone on sabbatical to the UK. And that's another long story. And I just decided that the confusion was just too much. I said, I wasn't going back to Ghana because I had to do it too. But that 
If you speak to the likes of mine, they will tell you that it is still going on. I speak to my colleague researchers and you'd realize that a lot of their research, if it's not coming from the likes of the Ford and the Ford Scholar, the Ford Foundation sponsored me all through my postgraduate and all that. It's still sponsored by their primary sponsor because your, whether it's your PhD advisor or whatever, that's where they get their funding from. That's where your research publications go to. And that is where you build your credentials and therefore they know you and they can trust that you will deliver and then they sponsor you. But what that means is that when you then get the information out, it has to be attenuated to the requirements of the country where you come from, which is Ghana. But then our governments Kwame, do again, not... Kwame, if I could interject again, sorry. So, yeah. you know the schemago graphs or data that I showed, right? Yes. Where we were seeing a very healthy trend from, you know, over the years with research output and papers and publications going up and rising almost at the same, following the same curve as GDP. Mm. Are you saying that much of the work was sponsored by foreign money? Yes, and that was what Marion also yes. said at the start. Yes. <laughs> it was sponsored by foreign money. And that is the point I wanted to make because that was, you asked the question, you said you don't know. And yes. because I have worked and I still traverse because I spent about five, six months flying out. I, I call myself a nomad now. I live in the UK, but I, because of CDD, I predominantly practice in Ghana and because of COVID and my public speaking, um, my research always takes me to Ghana. And so I wanted to traverse from where Maria was coming from, where you're coming from, because of the you don't know caveat that you put, so that we can start bringing some closure yeah. to that and know where we go from here. The truth of the matter is yes, a lot of it is sponsored by organizations from out. And uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, yes, and, I, uh, and I'll tell you why. If you want me to explain why, I can go into the numbers so you appreciate it. If you look at health as a sector, Ghana's health expenditure per capita is $78. That is the amount of money we spend in a year on each citizen or 30.8, each of them. Of that, only 38% is paid by government. And of the government quota, 75% goes into salaries and emoluments. So when they've taken out everything, maintenance and everything, they've got 0.3% left for everything else. How do you sponsor R&D? Sure. Compared with the UK, where the Medical Research Council, which you and I have benefited from, Leo, get their 6% from GDP. Sure. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's COVID or what. Yeah. It's 6%. So if the economy shrinks, you get 6% of the shrunk economy. But even let's look at it in COVID. When the economy shrunk and they needed a 6%, what? The government knowing that we needed vaccines, then true in what? 800 million. Bank. That wasn't part of the research and development budget because we were in a pandemic. So quantitative easing and we'll give you that money. Ghana doesn't have that luxury. So you have the likes of Marion who can, they can beat the world because I've worked with them. I grew up with them. My father was part of them. I was part of them and I left. They can beat the world. But the point is that he who pays the piper calls the tune. So if, for example, Galam say, I'm, I'm trying to be very practical in this conversation. And Marion wants to look at the impact of arsenic or mercury or lead on the intellectual abilities of the three to six year old, because we know all these things affect the ability to concentrate on all that. Mm -hmm. The Ghanaian government doesn't want to pay for it. The United States government pays for it. They would put their spin on their research because the outcomes must suit the payer. And that's where we are not benefiting. So you see our papers going up, but that is where what you are talking about prototyping doesn't come in. Because 
what we need to prototype to actually get the intellectual property and therefore create jobs and therefore drive our science ecosystem. It's not happening. So every time I go on social media and I see things like that, and they say, oh, we've got people in Kenya yesterday, and they are always saying they are researching, but we don't hear anything. That is why I struggle. I'll leave it here because it's, it's a whole kind of worms, this topic that we've come. And that's why you, um, you were brilliant in doing all the paper things, the independent organizations. But when it comes to the practicalities, there are so many defects that perhaps we need to look at. Hey, I want to ask um, kind of like a um, kind of a follow-up question to um, Kwame. Um, but then I think Prof has raised her hand. So I'll let yeah, I wanted to now. add that um, in, even though we we are depending largely on the external funding, um, the universities have some micro funding that we, we are able to access and CSIR as well, my research indicates that. So the public universities and the research institutes and the GAEC and the rest have seed money for visibility studies and for small scale research, which could fund a, a low budget PhD, for example. But the larger chunk of our funding is, is being uh, driven by external donors. And I, I agree with Kwame that indeed, once you are not the one paying for the research, you don't determine the, the expected outcomes. Mm. So that is where we, we are challenged as a people. Yeah, you can continue. Yes, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned um, when um, when Leo was showing the graphs and then he was talking about areas where Ghana seemed to be playing leading roles. Um, there was so much focus on um, the social sciences um, business. Um, those are very important areas in terms of uh, research output. But if we are talking about stepping out our capacity in terms of, for example, we are talking about prototyping and in terms of invention, then we need to also step up when it comes to engineering or when it comes to, for example, technology or some other sectors, which were not shown on the graph at all, meaning that we are not playing leading roles in that. So my question to you then uh, will be, I think, I don't know whether from your research, you went in depth into how some of these specific sectors like engineering and technology um, was progressing over time, uh, whether we have some information on that. But given that uh, based on the graphs, we are not playing leading roles in that on the African continent, how can we reorient our training system and as well as the research culture to step up in those areas as well, because we need those areas to step up in connection with the areas that we are already doing well to move forward. Right. I well, I guess it's to all of us, but maybe I'll I'll I will, I will go first. I think in terms of engineering, it, it, of course, it's it's hugely important. All right, it's hugely important. I think, you know, not so long ago we learned of um, the launch. I think there was a, a Ghanaian group that have launched some satellite into space, right? And yeah. and, and that that made all the headlines. All right, that made all the headlines. So then the question is, you know, so the intellectual capacity and ability is there. And of course, being able to go that far, you know, which is which is great because if you if you juxtapose that to the comment that I showed up, you know, the quote from um, Neil Armstrong, for example, you know, Ghana is following in that in that you know following in those steps. Okay, so. It isn't about intellectual ability or I guess the, you know, the brilliance to be able to do these things, but perhaps, of course, the funding aspect is, is a huge constraint, all right? But I wonder whether within our systems that our behaviors is also a barrier to all of that, you know? As great as engineering is, um, you know, perhaps we don't devote a lot of attention to it. And if not, why not? Why not? Incidentally, when I was sort of researching the topic, um, there wasn't anything that came out. I mean, I didn't spend too a lot of time on it, given all the, um, you know, different things happening, 
you know, professionally and also, uh, I guess, domestically. Um, but there wasn't anything. But then if you think about it, when it comes to saleable goods, you know, let's put health to one side where most of the members of the panel, are, you know, that, that's their background, including mine. But when it comes to commercial products, whether they are, you know, in mobile telephony, the handsets and just gadgets in general, which, um, you know, sort of help people stay connected. You know, I think the, the ability to produce them, honestly, the ability to produce them perhaps isn't too, you know, big a deal. It's not too big a deal. Honestly, which is why I showed those video clips of, you know, local inventors, local inventors who have, you know, bright ideas and seems to want to do, you know, some good for society. Seems to want to do some good for society. You know, taking that guy who had this, um, you know, hand washing thing, for example, you know, clearly that take some form of engineering to be able to build a system like that. You know, so the engineering side, it's there. It is there at its grassroots. You know, so my question is, how come we don't harness some of these basic things? And even from the point of view of sort of being excited about them to see how they can be taken forward and improved upon if not for we're not even thinking about exporting them but for local use you know and so it's about using some of the basic things that we have you know that perhaps we don't really value we don't really value we would rather think about something that came from the uk or something that came from you know china increasingly you know and a lot of these things, perhaps they're built by school children, for all we know. You know, so I think we are really letting ourselves down when we don't kind of seize some of these little opportunities. You know, they may seem basic, you know, they may seem very basic. And I think if you look at a history of inventors as a whole, a lot of them didn't necessarily, they, they were not as educated as you and I, a lot of them didn't sit in classrooms with books day and night, getting all the qualifications you care about in the world. You know, but I think that's the one thing that the West, whether you hate them or love them, I think that's the one thing that they're so good at, that, you know, they know they have nothing else but their creativity. So they will take some basic ideas. They'll take some very, very, very basic ideas and give themselves you know, a 10 year horizon. And it's about perfecting it and improving it. Every little step is valuable and they'll painstakingly prepare it in such a way that in 10 years time, it's ready for sale or it's ready for marketing. And I think, you know, when I look at my own industry, you know, academic, academic people come to, you know, come to me for various discoveries that they've made and they want to sort of bring the idea to market, you know? And I don't know, do our academics think along those same lines whereby they want to commercialize some of those ideas? I would particularly like to hear, you know, Marianne's view on that, you know, where, you know, academic centers have got a bright idea and they would sort of spin it out of the, university departments to try and at least commercialize the idea, but then be committed to doing that. Be committed to right. that. I can, I can, I can, can see so much. And I, I, I can see so much. Mary, Mary. Do you want me to react? Mary, no, no, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm going to go in, like I said, I always see professors as my parents and I'm going to make <laughs> something based on history. No, right, then I could react. connect for the present. Yes, look, we all are here. It's great you said that we all have a science background. Currently, the leading treatment for malaria is a combination based on a plant, Artemisa ani. 
So you have quartet and all those things. I'm going to give you history. In 1977, and I'm going very back, the Artemisa plant was in competition with another plant. Where did they come from? Ghana. It was called Cryptolepis sanigolenta. It was researched. It was researched upon by Professor Juma Bedu, who was then dean of the Faculty of Pharmacy, and whose colleague won the Nobel Peace Prize in Chemistry after he had died with the same plant. That is where, if you hear tabia and all those things that they sing for treatment of malaria, they come from this cryptolepis plant. It contains an alkaloid called cryptolepine. It has similar effects on the plasmodium as Artemisa or Arteita or Artemita has, right? And you can go and search the data, you'd find all the scientific papers. When in 1978 that was published, and this was at a global WHO conference on rollback malaria, the same time as the research on atomicinin and all the derivatives that now gives us all the quartems and all that that we now, and malarone and all that that we take when we are going to Ghana, those of us who live abroad. We were not prepared to invest in, um, in cryptolepin. The Chinese invested in Artemisa. Today we know where we've ended. I'll give you a second plant. The second plant is a plant for, has anyone heard of cocaine? It comes from a plant called erythroxylum coca. In Ghana, when you start climbing the hill up to a brie, there's a plant called erythroxylum truxillans. It contains a gonin hydrochloride. And that was why Mariana said, I wanted to come before you because you are a chemist and you have the, all the data on this. So I wanted to set you up so you can answer me. It contains a plant called agonic hydrochloride, which is the precursor, which we talk, if we scientists talk about precursor, I'm a chemist, I'm talking chemistry and I'll break it down. It is the forebearer of cocaine, xylocaine, lidnocaine, all the anesthetics that you can think of this world. It grows free on the equipping range. It's the same plant that grows in Colombia that they make cocaine from and export Ill illegally and they make xylocaine and all the anesthetics that we use for our savior and kind of sell to us. We have enough research on that since 1974 from Professor Kufo, who came from University of Redden as a full professor from Oxford with all the research from his PhD. Have we developed it? No. We still buy these things as synthetic products and these plants grow on the ridge. I've just given you two. I'm a botanist son. My dad was co-researcher with all these people I'm mentioning because they were health people. He just had to tell them the plants and as a plant pathologist, do the toxicology. But I'm, I've just given you two products. To answer your question, Leo, that the answer is yes, they have availed themselves because that's why you have Tabia, we've had Malafan. People do not know. In the 90s, there was Malafan. There was Malahep. All these things came from cryptolepin. Have we even extracted the main product from cryptolepis, which is um, cryptolepine, to actually develop it as an anti-malaria, or we are selling it as herbs and bitters. That is a lot. So sometimes when I sit on fora and people want to blame the professors like Marek, I always come to their defense. 
not because my dad was a professor, but because from childhood, I sat at the feet of these people. I saw the research they were doing. Their publications are there. That's why I've given you their names. You can go and research it. And I asked myself, are we serious as a country? And so, Marion, that's where I want you to come in. All right. I would want to touch on both yours and then Leo's, connecting it to prototyping and innovation. I, I agree with you that all this data is available and we need to scale it up or do the isolation of the active ingredients, which will help us to commercialize these products beyond the herbal formulations or decoctions that we have on the market. But on a broader scale, well, I talk about all the challenges that we are having as SEM professionals, coupling that with the engineering bit. I, I would like to touch a bit on funding. You know, globally, even though we are saying that majority of our funding is coming from external sources, these days, the major target areas for funding is public health, and climate science, the environment, no one pays for business, no one pays for engineering, very little, unless you're connecting that with climate or with something like that. So that might be a contribution to why the, the, the numbers on engineering is low relative to the others. Now, in terms of prototyping, all the major public universities now have centers of innovation and business incubation. And so that is a good place to start. And we're doing that. And some businesses have emerged out of the innovations of student projects, which they stayed on to work on. But what I will be proposing at the national or high level is to have a marketplace where business, the public sector and academia can meet for a cross-pollination of these ideas. We don't have anything like that on the national scale as a nation. I, I can cite the case of the Science Forum of South Africa, for example, where annually they meet and they bring scientists from around the world and bring this as well to the same space, together with business owners and funding agencies. And presenters are applauded. You talk about reward for or applaud for those who excel. Once you do a presentation and it's found uh, impressive, you are given a medal. <laughs> it's not good, but it's similar to a Nobel and it's a good feeling. And I think that urges scientists on to do more. I have one of those medals. So I, 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 <laughs> I think Ghana could do same if we have such a marketplace where scientists come to present their work, whether it's just at a publication level or prototype level and meet business owners in the pub public or private sector, because we really don't have an established structure. Sure. where there's a direct link between sure. the academia or researchers and the private sector. And that is a huge gap that is in our landscape. Right. So, so I'm going to stop you. Um, sorry, sorry about that. Um, just to, because in the interest of time, um, just to give the opportunity for us to have a broader discussion with everybody else. And then you can also, of course, come in again. Um, I just wanted to also comment quickly on what Prof was saying and Kwame was saying. You know, there's always there's also an opportunity now, especially at the grassroots level or community level, where we have like different kinds of innovation hubs popping up, and uh, we have a lot of young people prototyping solutions and testing ideas. And luckily for us, these are not people who are just uh, playing around with tools that they have at their disposal. Many of them have also gone to school, they've gone to university, they've studied things like engineering. So the gap that we want, one of the gaps that we want close. Uh, between um, academia and, um, for example, the mechanics or people who do hands-on uh, activities is being closed because of the presence of these uh, maker spaces and innovation hubs that are coming. And it's good that universities are beginning to set up some of these structures. I think that we can also try to close this gap by introducing uh, practical research into some of these maker spaces and innovation hubs trying to work with the universities and of course, uh, creating platforms like the Science and Technology Forum that uh, Marion was talking about. Um, so we have some comments coming in here and one of the people who is commenting a lot is uh, Jekonaya. And like he said before, he's doing his PhD on exactly this topic. And I think that he's quite interested in um, joining the conversation, asking some questions and making some points. So I want to give him the chance because he, he will also be leaving us shortly. So Jekonaya, if, if you want to come on. 
thank you, uh, Gameli, and thank you to our esteemed, uh, you know, speakers. Um, I think he, much of the issues have also been raised, uh, you know. But I, I just have just a few comments. Uh, that uh, one of the comments that I've made is that uh, if you look at the relationship between uh, research and development, we have sort of framed it from a linear perspective that, you know, when there is R&D, basically there should be some, uh, you know, um, benefits to the economy, benefits to, you know, the GDP and so forth, which I think came that there is there is need to be some careful navigation there because uh, this uh, relationship is uh, sort of uh, goes through a lot of um, you know some hoops to jump through uh, before we realize that that kind of, um, of 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 a linear relationship. So th there is more like a spaghetti. I, I've, I've, I've uh, you know sort of given it as a spaghetti relationship. Because there are sort of issues. I think uh, Prof has uh, mentioned that um, already right now, the framework is there in Ghana. All the policy frameworks are there. And uh, when you look at now, the kind of relationships between all these different sectors, are they communicating together? Are they really working together? What's the, the actual relationship? like you have rightfully put in one of the slides, that do we actually have this relationship that can actually be galvanized and you know, produce goods and services on the doorstep or even improve the quality of life of, um, of Ghana? And um, if you look at uh, the other issues, you have mentioned the triple helix model, which I think there is also a need maybe from what I've uh, discovered from the research so far, that um, there, is, there are what are called, uh, they, some they call them arbitrators or some they call them knowledge brokers. I would want to use it as knowledge brokers. Um, so we can have the industry, the government and so forth. As long as we don't have those people who are charged with that knowledge broking to say what is being produced from um, you know, the academia, how can it, uh, you know, um, make its way in the police corridor, how can it make its way in the industry and all that. So th there is sort of a lack of those knowledge brokers within the system, which I think is something that we may want to strengthen within our African continent, not only Ghana. Um, then of course, we have emphasized much on building capacity of individuals but without looking at the whole systemic approach. When we look at science and technology, we have scientists who can have the skills, but now they are getting into a system which uh, somehow is not proportional to their skill set. So maybe the issue of uh, building the whole systemic, uh, to have a systemic approach in terms of the capacity of science, because uh, from my experience, where I come from, Zimbabwe, you can have brilliant people. We are ranked as one of the educated and so forth. But now when you look at uh, all the innovations and all that, we, we are also in the same predicament. And the, it's more to do about, uh, you know, how we also build the governance structures of that science. How do we also build the capacity of those who also govern that science? which is also very important. I'm sure I'm not being political. I don't want to, to venture into the politics of things, but I think it's also another important aspect. Then last comment on the video. The young man is very happy about the invention, but how are we protecting the IP? What are our IP issues at national level? How do we also fit into regional and international IP systems? It's something that we need to build capacity as well. Because when I saw that, I, I wanted to cry that, look here, he's actually appealing for help. But already someone has looked at all the design system and it's already taken by someone else. <laughs> and they are going to build a stronger version of that thing. So thank you very much with those few comments. Thank you very much, uh, Jakunaya, for your inputs. Um, 
So Leo, um, any reactions to these thoughts? And of course, you had a previous point that you were going to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I, I certainly found what Jeconiah said about, well, he used the term relationship, all right? And of course, all that he's trying to say is that among the players or the stakeholders, we need to better bring them together and get them to talk, not just talk, but get them to kind of see how their work intersect with one another's and sort of cross pollinates all the ideas. And I mean, that is, that is key. And I think the research that um, the Regic um, made in the, um, on their website, uh, so some of the findings from the research that, that Regic um, placed on their website, they were actually talking about how the stakeholders will actually engage, which is why I put it in red highlight. I, I thought, you know, what an odd statement, how they can actually engage. So it means they, they are not actually engaging. They're there, but they're not engaging. I mean, how odd is that? I mean, I, I was lost for words and, and, I, and I couldn't believe it, which is why I wanted the, the, the panelists to actually um, sort of perhaps prove, prove that data wrong. I mean, actually engage. What do you mean by actually engage? Yeah, because on paper we are supposed to be engaging, but in reality we are not. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow, what a shocker. What a shocker. You know, there is then, no focal, focal area or points that we all need to engage, let's say periodically. Sure, sure. sure. So that brings me to the question that I had, Gamali. Now, going back to Paxty, you all remember Paxty, the Presidential Advisory yes. Committee, blah, 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 you know, on, on science, technology, and innovation. Now, mm -hmm. interestingly, one of Paxty's functions is to ensure that the voices of the scientific community is in the president's ear. Now, mm -hmm. talk to me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I, I, I'd, I'd want to come in on this. In the scientific, and that was the point I was making. Economics has always been the heart of the present year. What's GDP? What's GDP per capita? What's GNP, gross national product? Law, are we breaking any human rights regulations? Are we living up to our international contractual obligations? Are we doing this? Are we doing this? science? What's our innovation capability potential? No, the president doesn't care. What's our health expenditure per capita? Who cares? We haven't lived up to the Abuja declaration of 15% of government expenditure. So what? You see, the point, and that's why I like what Gamaly and co are trying to do. The citizenry do not understand the benefit of it until COVID came. Who cares about if you're a scientist, if you're a doctor, you are in R&D. Look, currently, we're talking about vaccine hesitancy, vaccine nationalism and all that. And people are talking about, oh, and that's bad. And why are the West hoarding the vaccines, blah, 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 blah. But we forget that in 2014, when the Ebola vaccine trials were going to be started in Ghana, we had a Volta caucus who went virtually on riot and rampage to say that we cannot be used as guineas. Forget that in 2020, when the Oxford vaccine group published that they were looking for collaborators because with vaccines, you and I work in this area. So we know that with vaccines, apart from the age demographics and all that, you need gender demographics also, you need um, ethnic demographics and all that. So you couldn't actually talk about the immunogenicity, you couldn't talk about the hospitalization and trends, you couldn't without actually having a broad spectrum mm. of all the races that exist. And what happened in Ghana? Well, I mean, just, let's look. Just, no, just no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, let, 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, very quickly. You know, just to say that of late, one very hot topic in R&D is called diversity, okay? Yes. Diversity. I I'll, I'll leave it at that. Please continue. Yes. And that's the point I'm making. We have been, in fact, it started from 2019 when the Global Health Security Index report was published and we saw the diversity skew. And then suddenly everyone was like, what's going on here? And that's the point I'm making. But if we want to talk about diversity, and even in the UK where you and I live, we see a disproportionate volunteering when it comes to ethnic minorities, when it comes to vaccine development, let alone in Africa, where we would say we don't want to be guinea pigs. The next minute we would say the white man doesn't want to give us vaccines. You can't have your cake and eat it. You've got to chop the cheese one way or the other. And for me, that is the disparity from your conversation and your presentation that we need to address. We've got all the paperwork sorted, but have we got the practicality sorted? And that is where we are failing. So the lives of you and I, who work in pharmaceutical research and development, who work in the pharmaceutical industry and all that, can talk for all we care. But all it takes is for one MP to say it's not going to happen in my constituency. We saw it with the malaria vaccine grounds. We've seen it with Ebola. We've seen it with COVID. What are we waiting for? And that is the grassroots conversations we need to help the likes of Marion to happen in Ghana so that they can expand their research so that we can play. Because it's not that they are incapable. And that's the point I want to make. Yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Yeah, so I would like to touch on Kwame and then Leo. Leo was talking about pasty and whether they are indeed the voice of uh, scientists or practitioners in the nation. I don't know. Personally, I know the members of the board. I have a copy of the <laughs> act that brought them forth. But in terms of being the voice, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm, I'm here to hear more about them. I, I know the average practitioner probably has not even heard about the existence. And so there is more that needs to be done. And I actually think that if Paxi and then the Ghana Academy are to team up, that could be the focal point for all scientists to, to have this kind of national conversation. Because so far it's at the various small you know, entities which don't seem to communicate with each other. They are acting in isolation and that is not the best for our development. Sure. With regards to promise, you were talking about, um, I would like to tie yours up to improving public perception about science. Because, uh, you know, scientists normally like to speak in our own jargons and uh, so, our practitioner researchers generally, no matter the field, like to use their own jargons and talk to themselves, each other, rather than to the, the society. And we also there's also the tendency to think that everyone who doesn't understand what you do is probably stupid. And the public also perceive the practitioners who don't communicate to their hearing and their understanding as being crazy. So there's one camp that is crazy, another camp that is stupid, and there's no middle ground. <laughs> And so I'm proposing that scientific research should be translated into language that can be easily assimilated by the populace if we really want to improve the public understanding and perception about scientists. And it's not just translation into everyday English, but also into our local dialects. So that linking that with the vaccine and the rejection that uh, the clinical trials face, if there were some griefs in their own mother tongue which had gone ahead before this exercise, maybe this, this issue wouldn't have become an issue. But sometimes as practitioners, we tend to impose uh, ideas in our own language on the people, thinking that because we think we know better, they ought to accept at all costs. So I think, again, that is a gap there that we need to work towards. If we want the agenda of using R&D to develop our country to be achieved and be holistic, in nature. And let me tie this a bit to uh, basic research. You know, again, the general perception in Ghana is that Ghanaian scientists don't do anything. 
KNUST has been in existence for 70 years. What have they done? So it's not every science or any scientific endeavor that has to translate into something visible or tangible. <laughs> Sometimes there's curiosity-driven science, which is basic science. And that is also fine. It's okay to Absolutely. do that. <laughs> and so again, in our discourse, we need to let the public know that it, science is not always translated into no. visible and tangible things, but it can also generate knowledge, which becomes the building blocks on which innovation and applied science will, you know, rest. It's, it's all about curiosity. It's, it's really all about curiosity. So, so that's also a very important element to add to it, which is why I think the work of the Science Cafe and, and, and Gamaly and his team, I, I think, although, you know, in a way you're still kind of young because you were formed, what, is it 2018? Yeah, officially registered 2017. And yes, right. Science Cafe started 2018. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so hopefully, you know, people will get to know more and more about it and beyond, if like, the, the, the confines of just the, you know, peer-to-peer -peer conversation, you know, the, of course, the, the broad objective is to communicate it to normal society, to, to lay society in, in effect, you know, and, and, and make society understand the important role that, that science plays in, in society as a whole, and, and hopefully as a nation, you know, at, at, on, my, on my slide, there was one topic about motivational behaviors, for example, you know, I thought that was important. I thought that was really, really important. And I think for practitioners in, in the Western hemisphere, for example, one thing that is a constant is that they are always going to evolve, not just the frontiers of science, but the culture of science, okay? The culture of science in terms of, I mean, the other time I was listening to Sir Paul Ness, many, many of you would have heard of Sir Paul Ness. He won the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology, I can't remember what year, maybe 2001 or so. And he's also a public speaker, he, you know, he, he engages in a lot of public speaking. And recently, I mean, he, he, I think he's one of the directors of the um, Francis Crick Institute, which is quite a new molecular biology lab, which for, for those familiar to London, um, would know it's it's near um, you know St Pancras uh, in London, and in terms of the design of the building, literally, it's an open plan office, all right, or open plan block. And the idea when he was talking about the idea of having, if like, science without barriers, is that he doesn't want the the cell biologist in in the I guess West Wing of of the building to not be able to talk to, um, if like the nuclear medicine specialist next door, because there's a wall between them. And it's about basically having no barriers. And the point I'm trying to articulate is that, you know, if you think back to say 50 years ago, all our buildings were sort of concrete blocks. We had our individual office. I remember when I first entered the industry, I had my own office. You know, this idea about open plan and, and the rest of it is quite, you know, quite novel, really, you know, and the idea was that, you know, person A would be able to simply chat to, you know, their colleague next door without having to even have, you know, get off his, his or her chair, you know, and it's about how this sort of conversations come about. And before you know, the nuclear medicine specialist thinking about a problem about a patient would bounce off that idea to the cell biologist. And between them, before you know, the problem that one colleague had, somebody will suggest another idea that they hadn't thought about. And so listening to Sir Paul Ness and how the design of the new building in terms of 21st century design of a huge institution like the Francis Crick Institute compared to how they designed buildings or, or scientific facilities say 50 years ago. So what I'm trying to say is that it isn't just about the work we do, but about, it's about the culture, which is why I put on my slide the motivational aspects of what we do and whether 
we are ambitious enough, and we are hungry enough for success. And guess what? These guys, they're masters of the universe, and they never stop. Even that is not good enough for them. You know, so it's about challenging ourselves, but you only challenge yourself with starting with your own behavior, starting with what motivates you. And everything else will be added. So I think a lot of these things, perhaps it starts, you know, they say charity begins at home. And how true that is, how true that is. It starts within ourselves and what we want to achieve personally for ourselves. Of course, as individuals, all of us around the table are highly accomplished, you know. So it's about our collective effort in locking all of that, I guess, individual effort in a synergistic way to hopefully, of course, it's only through the numbers that I guess our greatest potential could be realized. You know, I think between you and I, I have absolutely no doubt of our willingness, our commitment for, you know, for achieving our dreams and achieving our goals, you know, but I think how we translate that on a collective level um, to basically bring all of that together in a synergistic way to harness the, the potential of R&D, I think is what is really lacking. I think above, you know, perhaps among other things, no doubt funding being part of it. And, and I don't want to talk leadership here because I, I promised myself that we were not going to talk the politics thing and about leadership and about this and about that. And, and I think so far we've done great, you know, but, and there's always a but, you know, we really need to be ambitious to the scale that if we want to reduce poverty and achieve our sustainable development goals and all those lofty um, frameworks that we've put together to realize that on an economic level, I think we need to do much better. We need to improve. And I've, I've no doubt that that is on everybody's minds, especially the minds of, you know, our policy makers, you know, but I think beyond the funding and beyond all those, you know, challenges, I think there is something within ourselves and, and within our, our own uh, behaviors that perhaps also needs to be, certainly be brought to the fore to make all of this happen, I think. Thank you very much, um, Leo. Um, uh, yeah, talking about politics, uh, unfortunately we can't do away with politics because that's like the foundation of um, how changes can be made in, uh, how changes can be made in a society. But what is more important is um, having very clear objectives that will benefit the country or that will benefit everybody. And of course, uh, working sincerely and collaboratively to achieve that. Um, I think there are two comments on this. Uh, from Kizito and Charles talking about speaking truth to power and at the same time also talking about um, accountability and other elements that they think are very crucial. Yeah, and, and, and that's very true, of course, but again, I agree with you, I'm not taking things from a partisan perspective, but really seeing where the evidence points and what can work uh, for us. Um, I think we have really run out of time. I mean, when we have these types of conversations, we get so passionate. There are so many wonderful and crucial points um, that we raise. Um, lots of um, discussion points also being raised in the chat. I was wondering whether any of our participants have any questions that haven't been addressed because all the questions that I put, um, I prepared or put forward, I think have been answered. And uh, whether anybody had any um, final comments or inputs that they want to add to the conversation. Can you use a raise hand feature so that I can call you? Okay, there's no interest. So perhaps, I think Leo has given an extensive summary. I don't know if Prof or Kwame have any last final parting yes. words that they want to share with us. Yes, Prof. I, I wish to highlight it on a few of uh, the gains or the positives that we've been able to achieve as a nation with uh, R&D. And uh, that was very clear or evident during the heat of COVID last year, the innovations that came up, which uh, Leo has shown some. And also I, I would like to mention um, 
um, which country is this? That's a who, who, who are now producing uh, almost all the ethanol they use for yeah, spirits and the various formulations from cassava in Ghana. I think that is worth noting. And then linking that to the one Shade one factory, I think science, uh, technology, innovation driven research and development can help identify indigenous knowledge and indigenous practices in the various districts, which it can be scaled up. So when you go to a place where they are doing um, earthenware pots, for example, that is where you channel the energy to by exploring what else the clay there can be used for. You go to a place where they are doing tiger nuts, you know how to exploit the, the milk from that side, so on and so forth. So all these can be achieved. The one district one factory policy can actually be achieved if we are serious about um, harnessing the, the gains of science and technology innovation and not just, you know, um, politicizing everything as we typically do as a people. I'm also proposing a national development plan, which is long overdue. We have talked about this. If we're able to do this, which is bipartisan, then it will be binding on wh whoever comes into power as a government. And then we all hold ourselves accountable. And if in that development plan, there's a, a, a session dedicated to R&D and critically detailed into you know how we're going to achieve all these with a, a smart plan then gradually we will be able governments that will come and go will find the need to invest the little bit of our um, you know gdp that we are talking about into r d because it's a high level decision that needs to be made we cannot do this as the private sector will do their bit but for every nation that has developed this has been a decision that has been taken at the high level, and we need to be committed to that as a nation. And then industry players can come in. So tying that with COVID, for example, there was a national fund that was created, and then we had a private sector fund, which was also created. You know, the private sector and the rest of the populace take a cue from what government does. So this one is, is a given. We need to do that. And once we have done that, look at what the private sector uh, fund that was set up was able to do within three months. <laughs> within three months, a, a new treatment center, state of the art, was built in response to a need. Yeah, so, yeah. If we, yeah. so if we will be serious about this and not wait till emergencies where we are squeezed them before, if within three months this could be achieved, and if you look at this short, medium, and long term, I think we can do fantastic things. We just have to be intentional about it, that with our R&D, we cannot develop as a people. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, the, the behaviors aspects obviously speaks volumes, right? Now, there is a saying that you roof your house when the sun is shining, all right? <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Again, I go back to my childhood. And I always say this. As a people, we have a lot from our natural research that we have never invested in. That is where R&D starts from. And we need to go back to some of these and build on them using the latest technologies like artificial intelligence to leapfrog the general population. Like Leo said, we cannot get to any point without doing these things. And that is where I believe it. Our research and development would totally have to be underpinned by our history, our anthropology, and our way of work. Thank you. Thank you very much for your brilliant insights and inputs. Um, I'd say a big thank you to Leo for your fantastic presentation. Um, the main thing I picked from it among all the brilliant points was the fact that there was Regic, which is a body helping to create uh, funding, make funding possible for research and innovation. So I think all of us here uh, who are stakeholders should learn more about Regic and see how our work can interface with our body to drive um, STI in Ghana. When I say STI, I mean science, technology, and innovation, not the other STI. Uh, Prof, uh, thank you so much for your, for your insights. Um, not only talking about the actual science that you do, but 
the connection between um, the science and um, society and some of the interventions that are already underway in terms of addressing the issues. And of course, um, coming in with that individual practitioner's voice, uh, calling out what needs to be addressed again to drive um, research and development in Ghana. And also Kwame, thank you so much for, and as always for your wonderful uh, perspectives and uh, cross-national perspectives, as well as uh, bringing in what's happening in the health space and then um, helping um, drive the insights from that space and generalizing it in terms of what uh, needs to be done next and uh, uh, what smart and simple things that can be done to, uh, to drive things forward. I, I picked a lot of wonderful points uh, from the chat. So it's very clear there are so many things that uh, at the grassroots level, at least, we can begin to do immediately. And of course, in terms of advocacy, there are also some clear points that we can um, keep um, kind of developing programs and uh, developing our communications and uh, policy engagement initiatives around that. So I think that that is great. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll just say thanks to everybody for joining us uh, and uh, helping us to have a fantastic uh, conversation. Um, I think uh, we'll just close with our usual uh, ritual of taking a group picture. So if, if you can kindly turn on your 